<clears throat> we'll get going with a little brief intro to what we're talking about today, a little bit on how we got there, and then, you know, maybe some of you can't see the board. That's okay. We're going to draw on it anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, once things kind of make sense, we're going to take some of those uh, raised hands and just show it to you, okay? Because this is, I'll be honest with you, it, it kind of blows our minds sometimes still. I'll share with you some, like, case studies that we've had just in the last year that were really kind of eye-opening for us. But, you know, that sheet you see in front of you, uh, we're, today we're talking about shoulder pain specifically because that's our favorite. But really, we use the Keystone Reset as the starting place for all pain no matter what. Uh, and the reason for that has just kind of been this evolution over time. Chris tried to pull it out of me before we started, but I told him he's just going to have to wait like the rest of you. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> when I first started energy, working one-on-one, -on -one, I was coming out of that environment where I was only getting maybe 15, hey, come on in, uh, only 15, maybe 20 minutes with clients. And so I was, I was doing a lot of manual therapy. I was doing a lot of work on joints. Uh, now, the great thing about that is I got a lot of reps in, and so I got really good at it because it's all I did all day long, and I was just doing it over and over and over and over every single day. So we, we got to a lot of quality through the quantity that we had to take in that setting. The thing that was weird to me when I started working one-on-one -on -one is – you know, somebody was coming in to see me for a shoulder, and all I had ever done previously was look at their shoulder and do exercise for the shoulder and, you know, all these things for the shoulder. And then I had to figure out how to fill an hour because <laughs> I, I was telling these people, hey, look, we're going to spend an hour just me and you, you and the doc. And so the very first patient, I was like, okay, they're going to do six visits with me, six hours, and I only really know how to spend 60 minutes over the course of these six <laughs> visits with these people. And so – my, my idea at the time was just, okay, well, I'm just going to check all their joints so that probably I could just never run out of things to do. Uh, I, could, I could always do stuff in the shoulder, and if I needed to fill more time, I could help them clean up the ankles or the hip or some things in the ribs or the spine or something like that. And so that's where it started. And, and from that moment on, we, we looked at every joint on every client that walked through the door every single time. After about, <clears throat> I don't know, 400 of those, it was just super clear that everybody that was coming in, whether it was for their shoulder or their hip or their back or their foot, they all had these same patterns of restriction. Uh, so <clears throat> the person with shoulder pain, they had the same stiff asymmetric ankles as the person with back pain or ankle pain. And they had the same stiff asymmetric hips or shoulders. Uh, <clears throat> and so we just started picking up on these patterns that everybody had. Now, the degree of the asymmetry could be different. Uh, you know, which side moved better or worse than the other could be different. Uh, but we were just really starting to understand uh, in the context of moving your body, like people have the same asymmetries uh, and limitations in other joints that don't hurt. Uh, so it, we started just being really conscious around, okay, well, if all these things don't work like they should, how is that impacting this thing that hurts? And over time, we just started to understand in the context of functional movement, squatting, lifting, bending, pushing, pulling, your whole body is moving and the way your ankles work and hips work be become very important for how your shoulder is working or not working or the amount of additional stress your shoulder is going to take because of the other things that aren't working very well. So let's fast forward. We kind of rolled that track for a while and it was really great. But then we also started seeing that even though you know, some people had stiff asymmetric hips, but maybe ankles were okay. That's, that's not very common. Almost everybody's ankles are very stiff. So nobody in here is a special snowflake, I would think. None of your ankles are probably working well, if I just had to guess. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't mean they hurt. Just doesn't mean they're normal. Uh, but what we started seeing is that 100% of the people had an asymmetry in the pelvis. And this, we first started checking this only for low back pain. Somebody came in for low, low back pain, we would check this specifically. Everybody else, we were still checking ankles, knees, hips, spine, shoulders, elbows, wrists, and hands, and necks. But this one specifically for the low back. Once we started checking that on everybody, then we started to see 100% of people who were coming to us for a pain problem 
had an asymmetric pelvis. You may have heard of this as sacroiliac dysfunction, uh, which for a long time was kind of hokey. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, kind of messaging in the marketplace of those joints don't move. Uh, there's a lot of like flip-flopping back and forth. Yes, they do. No, they don't, depending on what camp, you know, the professionals in. And we'll just start with this. We don't care. <laughs> Whether it moves or not, whether what we think we're doing to the joints is true or it's something different, what is irrefutable is that when we do the thing we do, the things that happen after that are crazy, and they happen to almost every client we've seen in the last two years. So we're not going to get hung up on, yeah, you know, this camp over here, this camp over here. We've got some scientific reasonings behind what we do and why we do it and how it works, and we just lean into that. But the point is not what one person says or the other is that it works. And we're going to show you that with our generous people here today. Uh, so we'll hunt out some restrictions that they have, probably in the shoulder if it hurts. Uh, we'll do the clinical keystone reset, which is pretty quick and easy and super awkward. So buckle up. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then we'll recheck and there will be no doubt an immediate change in either pain or motion or both. So that's kind of how we got here. Once we started picking up on, hey, everybody has this, then what we started doing was checking all the joints, just drawing attention to stiffness and asymmetry, uh, depending on you know, what that was. Then we would do the reset, and then we'd go back and recheck. Uh, and this is where our eyes were really open to how expansive it was and why we began starting with this all the time. So like a couple of case studies that we've seen just in the last year that were a little bit mind-boggling even for us was bilateral rotator cuff tear. This one was one of Cadence. 40% uh, known tear on MRI, severely limited range of motion, and a lot of pain. Uh, she had, what, 95% of her motion back in two or three visits, and, and uh, t totally pain-free walking out that day. Uh, yeah, so it was, it was pretty crazy. So she picked up probably 90% of her motion after the keystone. Is that right? Okay, yeah. So this was somebody who we know has rotator cuff dysfunction to a higher degree. She's really looking to avoid surgery. Um, and, and we do this thing and she picks up a lot of motion very fast. She was very, very happy about that. Uh, probably one of the next ones was our first like test into this one that we had ever done. Uh, just for whatever reason, we don't see a lot of uh, foot and ankle in our clinic. Uh, we see a lot of shoulders and we see a lot of low back. Um, <clears throat> but one of my clients that I had been working with for training actually came in and said, hey, I've had plantar fasciitis for three months. Uh, she had gone to some therapy up in Lafayette where she lives. Uh, she had done about 12 visits, I believe, if I remember right. Um, she had the scraping. She had the needling. She had the stretching. She had the strengthening. She said it hasn't changed in three months. I wake up with it. I go to sleep with it. Uh, I said, okay, well, let's try this. Just full disclosure. I don't know if this is going to work. We're going to do it anyway. <laughs> she, she agreed. And so we did just the reset. She stood up and walked pain-free for the first time in three months. Her range of motion went back to normal. And so there are just things that were, I mean, they're still crazy to us kind of because it's pretty recent, us kind of stumbling onto this. And so we feel very fortunate that we have because uh, a lot of the people we're catering to right now, they've already been through the healthcare ringer. They've done the therapies, they've done the chiros, they've done the meds, the injections. Uh, a lot of them are confronted with surgery and may or may not be okay with that. And so, you know, we feel fortunate to be able to help these people. And, and in those cases, it's very, very important to do it very fast. Like people need to know that it can change. Uh, otherwise they're gonna continue down a pathway that they're probably not super happy with. So uh, I'm gonna draw on the board a little bit <clears throat> of kind of how this thing knits together and, and why it makes sense to us anyway. Um, <clears throat> and there are a couple of things that that I've done in the past that have kind of solidified the science behind this for me. Uh, one was, it's been, it's been probably four or five years ago. Is anybody familiar with functional movement screen, the FMS? Yeah, somebody, yeah. Um, a branch of that that's more medical is the selective functional movement assessment. This stuff comes down through Gray Cook. Um, really clever stuff. Uh, it was my first really view into like a full body screening to see how are things working. And they had a concept what's called regional interdependence, which is like if the shoulder's not working well, what are the things pretty close by? 
and how can you check the hips in ways that affect the shoulders. And so that was kind of my first eye-opening experience into some of the connectedness of the body. Uh, fast forward a couple years after that, um, <clears throat> I jumped into dry needling. Uh, super fun if you haven't done it. I'm kidding. Uh, but but, it, but it's very effective. Like you know, People curse me walking out. They curse Caden walking out, and they say, I will never do that again. That's the worst thing. And then they come back, and they ask for it <laughs> uh, because it, it just really does work. When it is the right thing to do, it is very right. Uh, but what that opened us up to is that in school, this, remember, this is not that long ago, and Caden even more recent, um, <clears throat> All referred pain came from the spine. Like if it's going down the leg or down the arm, it was disc or nerve root. Dry needling opened us up to a world to understand that probably 98 or 99 percent of radiating and referred pain is muscular <coughs> because we can dry needle and it completely goes away. Um, <clears throat> and just just clinically seeing a lot of low backs, uh, we probably attribute one percent to disc or nerve root at this point. Just by, by going a little more broad, we've been able to isolate things to muscles and movement more than anatomy over and over and over again. Did you have a hand up? Can I, I'm not sure what dry needling is, although I've had cupping done where they do the needle thing and then the cupping. Okay. Is there anything like that? A little contraction that pokes the needle into you 29 times before you put the cup on and suck the blood out? I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> so... It sounds like, no, there, there are also different camps of needling. Like some people put the needle in and leave it. Some people put the needle in and hook electrodes to it and have like electric stimulation through it. Other people, it's just pistoning in and out. The goal is to resolve trigger points. And so that's what we do. Um, <clears throat> but it is a thin filament needle. It's not like an injection. Uh, it's like, it's super thin. You have to like really look for it to even see it. Uh, but the goal is to go intramuscular to remove this restriction. We won't get too out in the weeds of the science there, but very effective when it's the right thing to do. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, that just opened, opened us up to pain referral patterns in a bigger way. And then kind of the final piece was really an anatomy trains course. Anybody heard of anatomy trains? Well, anybody ever heard of fascia? Okay, yeah, so five years ago, fascia was weird. Nobody understood it. It was not. It wasn't real. It wasn't a, like a thing. Uh, now we're, we're picking up on it. It's, it's really a lot of dysfunction in the fascia. It covers you absolutely everywhere, even to the point where, uh, in gross anatomy, like cadaver labs, they've actually been able to peel away the layers in a way that maintains the entire fascial system, and it's like a bodysuit. Uh, it's just under the skin. It's interwoven through the muscles, it integrates straight down into the bone. The periosteum of the bone, which is the outer layer, is actually a fascial covering around the bony surface. And so <clears throat> what that opened us up to was how this tissue that covers you everywhere has these different attachment points on the body that really connects foot to the head and, and everything in between. And that's where it really got real for us with the Keystone Reset and how uh, manipulating these joints first can create things up into the shoulder and the neck and down as far into the plantar fascia itself. So I'll draw you this little picture. Uh, last time I drew it, it was pretty bad. I'll try to do better. Uh, and I'm going to choose green because that's our, that's our color. Let's see if it's a good, no, nah, that's a bad green. Uh, we'll go red. You'll probably see that better anyway. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, has everybody seen a keystone in architecture? Okay, yeah, you got the brick archway comes up, got this keystone wedge right in the middle. Its function is to support the archway coming up and all the weight stacked on top of it, okay? Uh, when we look at the sacrum in the body, it's exactly the same, okay? We got the triangular shape, which looks like this. And then we've got, we're just gonna say, here's the pelvis on each side. And then we got femurs coming out, down here that moves straight down to the feet, okay? So what we have is essentially the lower, the lower half is an archway that feeds straight into this triangular structure just like we see in architecture. And then of course we have all the weight stacked on top. Now this person is gonna be very disproportionate with very long legs and a very short torso, all right? Uh, but up, up here, you know, these are gonna be our other things that are important like the head and the shoulders and of course we have you know, the rest of the arm extending down from there. 
What we have found is that all fascia integrates onto the pelvis, and a lot of muscles integrate onto the pelvis. Okay? Now, the pelvis technically is a circle from the top down. Okay? Circles have no sides, which means dysfunction in a left-sided joint or right-sided joint don't necessarily mean pain somewhere around the low back or shoulder is going to be directly associated with that. Uh, <clears throat> but what we see on the front is all the fascial planes in the upper half coming down and feeding onto the pelvis, all of them from the pelvis feeding down into the lower half, kind of like a turntable for trains. Okay, so everything on the front half integrates right here on this bone called the ASIS, uh, and then from the ASIS down to the feet. There are spiral tracks that wrap around the leg. Uh, same thing in the arms. There are lateral tracks that just cover straight plane side to side. Uh, superficial front tracks and deep. So we got stuff like just under the skin uh, along the abs down onto the pubic symphysis or the deeper structures that like come up through the hip flexors and the diaphragm and up into the deep neck. Um, same thing going down the back of the leg. Okay, we got these superficial back lines that go right down through the hamstrings and terminate as the plantar fascia in the foot. So what we're looking at is when there's dysfunction here, what we found is that 99 times out of 100, it's the same. Uh, there is side glide dysfunction in the lumbar spine. There's rotational dysfunction forwards and backwards in the left and right half of the pelvis. Uh, and then there's a couple other things going on. But there's six joints you really have to consider when we're talking about Keystone. It's L5 and S1. You got sacroiliac left and right. You got hip left and right. Uh, how many is that? I'm missing one. Oh, pubic symphysis in the front. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we don't know if this person's facing forwards or backwards, all right? Um, <clears throat> but those are the things that can all move. They are joints. Uh, or we're going to at least say that they move because when we do our thing, we think they move again and then things get better, all right? So uh, side glide is 50-50. Uh, sometimes it's side glide left, sometimes it's side glide right, uh, but 100% of the time it's present when sacroiliac dysfunction is present. So this is how we test for it. We can teach you how to test your side glide really, really easy. Matter of fact, we'll probably just all get up and do that in a little bit. Uh, so we can, we can have you self-test, do I have sacroiliac dysfunction, yes or no? Because if you have a weird side glide, you definitely do. That also tells us which side do we need to correct, all right? So... What we're looking at from an anatomy perspective, if these things change, you know, this pelvis should sit level, and the functional thing that happens is it makes one leg look longer than the other. Anybody ever had that told to them? Your, your leg's longer than the other one? Okay. There are not too many people who comprehend the full scope of how to address that. So you can manipulate at the spine and it will resolve some of that, but really we have to talk about all six of these joints if we're going to bring back into alignment and kind of complete the picture of what's going on. But when uh, one leg gets longer than the other, now all of a sudden the pelvis is tilted. The spine comes off tilted and it has to extend and rotate as it goes up, and then you can get weird stuff in the ribs, the upper back, the shoulders, because it disrupts all the muscular attachments all the fascial planes, all right? So some, some really easy ones are the lats, okay? Everybody know where your lats are back here? The lat goes from this shoulder, and it attaches down on top of this pelvis, this side of the pelvis, same side. It continues through what's called the thoracodorsal fascia, fancy word, over into this side, okay? So direct attachment to this hip, fascial connection into the hip joint itself. Okay, all fascia integrates down into what's called the joint capsule. Every joint in your body has a joint capsule. It's like the, the fibrous thing that holds it together, all right? Uh, the knee, in particular, ball and socket joints like the shoulder and the hip, they have deep connections from the fascial tracts that go down into there, all right? So you can see from a muscular perspective, we got a connection over into this hip, we got a direct connection onto this one. Uh, when we start looking over into the fascial tracks, what we see is we have a, a fascial track that's right here on the base of the skull. It goes over here and encases this shoulder blade, okay? 
and then it comes over here to this hip. You got the same thing over here. Okay, I'm going to end up drawing a lot, and it's going to look like spaghetti. So just stay, stay with me. Um, <clears throat> you've got tracks that run down the arms that are continuations of uh, fascia from the head. You've got fascia that goes from one shoulder down into the opposite hip. That's still the thoracodorsal fascia. Uh, but then from here, we see tracks going straight down the leg. We see tracks coming off the pelvis and spiraling down the leg. It creates some rotational stability. Uh, and there's tracks down the front, down the back, down the side, and then the spirals, right? So you can see the way this stuff is knit together, if you change an attachment point, so let's say we have an attachment point here and here, and this is normal. And then through whatever mechanism, the sacroiliacs move into dysfunction, and now this point is up here and this point is down here. Everything that attaches to those points has changed. Uh, and so when we start to make changes for the better, we can get new slack in areas that were really tight. We can get better tension in areas that had some uh, like not great slack in them. Uh, and, and this is kind of the science behind what we're seeing. When we start with these joints, we can create a lot of effect up into the shoulder. We can create a lot of effect down into the hips and even the ankles. And so most of the time what we see, and, and we're going to be really specific on the shoulder, uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the hip because the hips and the shoulders are super, super connected. Um, <clears throat> most of the time when we check somebody straight out of the gate, we see that, uh, for instance, the hips should move this way to 90 degrees. Okay, you should be able to push right there. Uh, and so let's say uh, right hip is 45 degrees and left hip is 60. So they're both stiff, but they're asymmetric. After the reset, they reverse. Left is 45, right is 60. These types of things become really important because if you just assume right is the tightest and you stretch that a bunch, it's actually a fake stiffness and you can end up creating instability because you're stretching a side that's not actually tight. Uh, you should have been working the other side, okay? So, w especially in the shoulder, because it's, it's, a, it's a ball and socket, but it's more like golf ball on a tee. So most of the structure is supported by uh, the capsule and the ligaments and the muscles that surround it. And what we really don't want to do is do a lot of stretching or mobilizing on a shoulder that is fake stiff and not really stiff. I wonder how many, like, unstable shoulders I created before I, you know, I stumbled onto this. We don't know. <laughs> Hopefully people are out there and they're okay. Uh, <clears throat> but what we want to do is get to the truth of what is actually stiff so that the things you do to correct that are very specific for what you need, not based on surface level, what does it look like? Uh, here's what happens in the shoulder. I'll walk you through our, our process specifically for that. So we check all the joints like I mentioned before. Uh, and if somebody has shoulder pain, we're really drawing attention to, okay, let's say they've got 150 degrees of flexion, 180 is normal, by the way. Um, we check what's called front rack position, which is here. So this is flexion and external rotation. Uh, it's an indication of great shoulder health. We saw this when we worked with a lot of CrossFitters. Uh, so that's where we picked up on this beginning, because they're constantly in like a front rack Olympic lifting position. When they were missing this, they had limited overhead and a lot of pain. As soon as we got back, their overhead went to normal, way better pain, just with a little bit of work. Okay, so we're checking overhead, we're checking front rack, and we're checking the traditional kind of 90-90 uh, internal and external rotation, and we're just drawing attention to whatever limitation is there. Hey, it should go here, but it only goes here, all right? First thing we do is keystone reset, and then we recheck the shoulder immediately. What happened? How much did we pick up with just the reset? Most of the time, it's going from 150 to 160, 165. Front rack is going to normal. That, we've just seen this over and over and over. And over. Uh, these start to pick up more motion, okay? If we don't get all the motion back with the keystone, we do the same side as the shoulder pain first rib. Anybody know where your first rib's at? Yeah, right, it's, it's way up here. Okay, and, and we, we tell that to people and they're like, oh, it's way up there? It's like, yeah, well think to the, like, the skeleton model you saw. That, yeah, that cylinder goes way up by the neck and that first thing you can feel right under there behind your collarbone is your first rib. Uh, so if we still have work to do, we still don't touch the shoulder joint itself, we do first rib next. After first rib, almost every time, 
overhead motion is normal. Okay? If we still have work to do after first rib, we go opposite hip through these connections. So you, and I just want to put you in the mental frame of like the people we're working with. They've had a lot of work done on their shoulder. You know, they've had 30 PT visits and they've had injections and they've been on medications forever. And so for us to do this and not touch their shoulder is really cool for them because they're super frustrated. Okay, if, if they come in and see us and we give them pulleys, fingers up the wall and therabands are probably going to lose their mind at this point. And, and so we just, we can't do that. And so when we follow this pathway first, what we're doing is getting to the truth about their shoulder. Sometimes that truth is there's nothing wrong with your shoulder. Sometimes you, you just got these things going on elsewhere. You just didn't know about it because you didn't know how to screen your own body. Nobody else was screening it because they can't because your insurance won't let them. Uh, and, <clears throat> or we get to the truth of like, Look, there was a lot of stuff being fed into your shoulder from these other places. What's left that is the real problem is this limitation or that limitation, and then we can very specifically solve that problem. And it might be some front rack, or it might be some external rotation or internal, or it might be overhead. It might still be a combination of all of them. But the point is, the shoulder a lot of times is not telling you the truth at first glance, and it's so, so important to uncover some of these other things that feed into that. And so maybe some of you have got shoulder pain and you've seen somebody and maybe it gets a little better and then maybe it comes right back. Okay, well the reason for that is pain is never where the problem is. Doesn't matter if it's your shoulder, your back, your hip. Uh, as a general rule, wherever the pain is, is not where the problem is at. It is somewhere else. And it could be anywhere else. An analogy we like to use is uh, the tr uh, transmission. Uh, I did some research. There's over 800 unique parts in a transmission. Seems like a lot. <clears throat> uh, but there's only one light on your dashboard that says when your transmission has a problem, right? Uh, your body is the same way, probably millions of unique parts, and you only have one indication that something is wrong, and it's pain. Pain is, pain is just an indicator, and as a second general rule, it is the last thing to show up when things have not been working well for a longer period of time. All pain, all dysfunction in the body as it relates to physical pain can be traced back to the way you move or the way you don't move over long periods of time, okay? You sit a lot, things get stiff, things don't work like you're supposed to, and then when you're not sitting, it's extra stress. You do that for long enough, the stress builds up, you have pain, okay? So pain is just an indicator you do have a problem. It is your responsibility and the responsibility of guys like me and Caden to help you figure out what that problem really is. Now, you let that problem go long enough, it'll turn into a rotator cuff tear, it'll turn into a labrum tear, it'll turn into bursitis or tendonitis or all those types of things, but that is not where it started, that's where it finished. And the way we like to do this is, uh, are y'all cool if we erase Fred? We'll call him Fred, okay. <laughs> is anybody in here's name Fred? Okay, good, 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 all right. Uh, <clears throat> So here's how I want you guys to start thinking about pain. This is easy, really easy. Doesn't, doesn't mean it's going to be uh, necessarily devoid of work to solve the problem, but if you can understand what is pain, why you have it, and how do you use it to navigate your way away from it, those are the best three questions you can ask yourself. Uh, you, I have a personal health care journey that, it, that is what led me here. Okay, so I, I get it. For, I've, been, I've been there for the low back and the shoulder and the knee and the ankle with lots of surgeries and things that ultimately were probably unnecessary. So <clears throat> I can relate. And so when people come in, they've never asked the question, what is pain? It's just this like thing that's out there with very little understanding around what it is. Nobody's asking why do I have it because if they were, the solutions people were getting wouldn't just be medications, injections, MRIs, and basic stuff and stretching, okay? Uh, and then the, the real key question is, how do I use pain to get away from it? Because pain is the best feedback loop on the planet. Anybody know what a feedback loop is? Yep, this thing happens and it tells you this over here. Pain is the best. It will reward you immediately for the right thing. It will punish you immediately for the wrong thing. And then the next question is, what about those things that I do, but then I wake up tomorrow and it's worse? It rewards you immediately for the right thing, okay? So if it doesn't reward you immediately, it's not the right thing, okay? 
uh, it's definitely not the right thing if it makes it worse, okay? There, there, are, there are conversations around no pain, no gain. That is not pain. <laughs> that, is, that is physical discomfort of pushing past your limitations, okay? Like training and working out and it sucks. And then you get sore and you work out again while you're sore. That is no pain, no gain. When we're talking about the physical, like neurological production of pain, the chemical production of pain, no dice, okay? Then the other thing that we really have to talk about, I mean, some people are like, oh yeah, and other people are like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. If you can't do it immediately, again, if you do it and it works, it makes you feel better, if you can't do it again immediately, it's still not the right thing. Uh, can anybody think of what that might be? I mean, how many times in a row can you take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen? before things start going really south, okay? How many, how many times can you take a hydrocodone before you're an addict? Okay, how many times can you have surgery over and over and over and over and over again? Okay, so there are things that while they can be helpful in allowing you to do the right things, just because it provides pain relief uh, in the moment or in this narrow window around it doesn't mean it's the solution because what we're looking for is a solution, right? Not a symptom hack not simple pain relief. What we're actually trying to deliver people, we call pain freedom, which is having the skills and strategies you need to know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it so that you don't get stuck with pain ever again. You're gonna have it, it's human experience. There, there's no way you go through your entire life and never have pain or resolve a pain and never have another one come back. If you're gonna be human, if you're gonna breathe, if you're gonna move, it's, a, it's an inevitability. But you don't have to get stuck with it. Okay. You can know the right things to do and how to do them to be able to help yourself get out of that very, very quickly. Okay, so <clears throat> I went on a rabbit. I went down a rabbit hole there. It was a good rabbit hole, I feel like. <laughs> uh, but what, this is what you need to understand about pain. All right, you pick your one to a hundred, one to ten, one to six, whatever. All right. So let's say I'm going to use six because I don't want to ride all the way to ten, uh, and it doesn't really. Oh, that's not right. I'm jumping ahead. Three, four, five, and six. Okay? Six is pain. Okay? One through five are the things that created it. Okay? This is how it works. It's called a lagging indicator. This is the last person to the party. Fashionably late every single time. Okay? Now, how long do you think relief you're going to get if you solve six first? Yeah, probably, probably, I mean, now some people do solve six and they might get a year. They take an injection and they get a year out of that. Some people take an injection and don't get anything, okay? But what do you think would happen if we made small changes in one, two, three, four, and five? What do you think happens to six? It's out of there, right? We didn't even have to work on it. And this is, this is one of the big detriments that we see is that it's so easy to get sucked into trying to solve pain that we miss the things that led to it in the first place. So we coined this term called the one degree physio. And it's a simple idea of if we can make a one degree shift here and here and here and here and here, we create a massive shift here without getting super focused on this area. And it just works over and over and over again. So, you know, we're talking about shoulder pain here today, but we, we, we make one degree shifts in the pelvis and in the hip and in the first rib and in movement. May, there might be a five, maybe not, doesn't have to be five, but the shoulder always feels better after we do that, okay? The way you move is controlled by your joints. The way your joints move is controlled by your lifestyle, okay? And so this is how we're always trying to back into the solution for these things is, okay, what's stiff? Why is it stiff? How do you make it unstiff? And then how can you manage your lifestyle in a way so you don't keep stacking the stiffness? Okay, you're not going to get rid of sitting, all right? You, you can't do it. The American life is sleep on your side in fetal position, okay? Uh, get up, eat breakfast, sit in fetal position. Skip on down to work in your car, fetal position, where you sit at your desk in fetal position for a long time eight hours. Okay, you get in the zone, could go four hours, not even move. Okay, you get in your car, you drive, let's just say you're driving to the gym, good for you, where you spend 60 minutes 
doing aggressive, not fetal position, and then you wonder why your body hurts. And then you get back in your car, uh, rode hard and put up wet, so they say. No cool down, okay? No, no like, how do we come down out of this sympathetic state from workout? Back into the car, maybe a little Netflix binge on the couch, fetal position, okay? Just clean up, shower, eat in fetal position, go back to bed, sleep in, on your side in fetal position, okay? And so, but this, these are the lifestyle things that lead to stress in your body. They lead to the stiff joints. They lead to uh, keystone asymmetry. And just knowing, okay, well, what, how do I hedge against that? Okay, what are some simple things I can do to break my hip out of this position so it's okay for it to be in this position? How do I get my shoulders out of this position where it's okay to be in this position? And that's the goal is to just give you these skills and strategies around, you know, how can I take care of myself? So really what we're looking at, we have ways you can self-screen. How do you test your ankles? How do you test your hips? How do you test your uh, uh, keystone? Okay, how do you test your shoulders? These are all things that we can create to do on your own at home. What we wanted to do for you today, though, is give you a way to test the keystone on your own. Uh, anybody want to do it? It's easy. Oh, so many options. Let's, let's go right here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to test it, and then we're going to actually take uh, the three or four or five of you that raised your hand. We're going to do exactly what we do in the clinic real quick here on the table. Okay, it'll be pretty cool. Hey, am I, am I time captain? 12 minutes? You're good. Oh, I'm good. 